And we are recording. Sabbath peace. Sabbath peace. It's another opportunity for us to come together and hear and learn of the Most High God. All honor goes to the Father through the Son, whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only hope for salvation. We know that it is obtained by grace, through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast and give freely as a gift <clears throat> to all who obey him. We understand that if you do not obey him, it is made manifest and made obvious that you do not believe. In this day, you should expect no good thing from the Most High, however. Anything that you do get, whether it be a gift of tongues, a gift of prophecy, or any supernatural experience that you may have, it can and it will be used against you in the day of judgment. With that said, peace to the saints that are in the room, to the saints that couldn't make it. No peace to the wicked. The only thing we say to them is repent that they might live. Can you go give me some water, please? Wait, hold on. Take this one downstairs here. Them two here. Give me some water. Don't put it in the same cup. Give me a fresh cup. Give me some water. So uh, last week, we uh, we really spent a lot of time in Daniel chapter 9 or or kind of covering Daniel chapter 9. Um, but uh, we talked about, you know, we talked about how Daniel, you know what I'm saying, was kind of being familiar with the prophecies of Isaiah, the prophecies of Jeremiah. You could tell that he read, he read, uh, you know, uh, kings, you know what I'm saying, talking about Solomon's prayer. He is familiar with a lot of the scripture, right? The curses in, in Deuteronomy uh, 28 and, and Leviticus 26. He was familiar with enough, enough of the scripture that he could kind of lay it out and he could craft a prayer that was full of superstition of the Bible. When I say superstition, I'm saying when the Bible say something will happen, he believed it, right? He believed it. He looked at it. He's like, listen, this is fact. This is law. This is how I should do it. And you can tell that's just how he crafted his life. He made his life. He prayed towards Jerusalem with the window open, despite the law being that if a person did something like that, they'd be thrown into the lions. Right. But because he saw it and he believed in it, he was willing to take that risk. Right. Our law didn't even say that you had to pray in that manner. Right. But he was willing to take that risk, even if it wasn't necessarily a law requirement right it's the same type of topics that we've talked about at different times we we've talked about there's nothing in the scripture that's going to tell you you're going to go to hell for not keeping the sabbath or for 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 eating pork or anything like that scripture our law tell us not to do it right moses commanded us not to do it moses commanded us uh with concerning the sabbath he said that we would be stoned right but there's nothing in our law or nothing in our scripture or nothing in the epistles or nothing in the gospels that says by not doing those things, you will go, you will burn forever in the, in the fire. You won't make it into the kingdom. We have specific sins that tell us what will make it into the kingdom and what won't. Right. But nevertheless, our mindset is, well, still, you know what I'm saying? We, if my employer tried to tell me to work on the Sabbath, I'm a, I'm a flatly deny. I'm a flatly deny. Like, no, I'm not going to do it. Not because I feel like I'm a burn in hell if I don't do it. But just because I believe that there's a blessing that's attached, that's attached to the Sabbath. Right? I don't believe that just because just because I'm making it up. I believe it because that's what the script, what is it? Uh Isaiah, what is it? 56 or 58? 58. Let's try 58. 58 Phil. When I think of eight, I think Sabbath or something. I guess I should think of Sabbath on seven, right? Let's do uh let's do Isaiah 58. Let's do verse one. Right. I believe the book. I believe what the book say. So it's like. You can't just, you know what I'm saying? Like for me, when they say what it say, it's like. I believe it. That's that's what it's going to be. So it don't come down for me. It's not even a mindset. of Oh, if I don't do this, I'm going to go to hell. That's not the mindset for me. Right. The mindset is, no, I'm trying to be great in the kingdom. Right. That's my goal. My goal is to be great in the kingdom. My goal is not to, you know what I'm saying? Not to just make it in barely. I want to be great. As much as possible. The brother said it's 58. We was right. It's 56. Oh, 56. Oh, yeah. The brother did say 56. Yeah, the brother did say 56. It looked like an eight on the screen. Appreciate you, brother. I don't know how you pronounce his name. Shalit. 
Appreciate you. I think it's Shalit, if I'm pronouncing that right. This is uh this is Isaiah chapter 56. Give me verse one. Thus says Yahuwah, keep mm -hmm. your judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that do doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on this, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keep his right? from doing He said, evil. he said, What is the man? Blessed is the man that doeth this. I believe there's a blessing attached to the Sabbath. Whether it send me to hell or not, whether it put me in the fire or not, I believe there is a blessing attached to the Sabbath. Not because that's just how I feel. Not because I like being lazy on Sabbath days. You know what I'm saying? It's simply because the books say blessed is the man who does these things. Keep going. Watch it. Ain't all he say. Neither let the son of the stranger that has joined himself to Yahuwah speak, saying, who has utterly separated me from his people. Neither let me let the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says Yahuwah unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths and chose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to Yahuwah to serve him and to love the name of Yahuwah be his servants everyone that keepeth the sabbath from polluting it and taking hold of my covenant even them will i bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer they burn off right so hold on let me show you something you see how he talked about the eunuch he said the eunuch you know what i'm saying eunuch kind of feel cut off why would the eunuch feel cut off because uh in the law said he who was uh uh wounded in the stones um they couldn't enter into the sanctuary that's book he talking about the eunuch who was made a eunuch. Remember, Yahushua, he told us, we don't have to grab it, but Yahushua told us, he said, a man could be made a eunuch or he can make himself a eunuch, right? He said, these, this is talking about the man who was made a eunuch. That means your, 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 your genitals is injured, right? There's something wrong with him, right? And the Most High God said in the 20, was it, 23rd chapter of Deuteronomy, I think it is, most high God said you can't enter into the congregation if that's your situation, right? If that's your testimony, you can't enter into the congregation. You better sit your darn, you know what I mean? Go, go you stand out there. But the most high God also said, yo, don't let yourself feel separated though, right? Read it again. Go back up to what is it, verse three? Neither let the son of the stranger that has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. Right? He said to the eunuch, don't, be, don't walk around saying you a dry tree. You know what I'm saying? That can't nothing happen with you. What the most high God say? Say it again. Neither let the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. Mm -hmm. What says the Lord unto the eunuch that keep my Sabbath and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant? Even unto them, I will give my house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. Right? He said, I'm going to mess around and make you better of a son. So although you was outside of the camp, now you're going to be better than a son or a daughter to me. Right? It's, it's important that when we read the stuff in the scripture, that we believe it. Believe it just at, without assumptions. The assumption is what's going to get us in trouble. Believe it without assumptions. You look at it and you obey what you see. You take it for exactly what it say. You ain't got to add nothing to it. Don't twist it. Right? Just take it for exactly what. Take your time learning the, learn the book. You got plenty of time, y'all willing. But learn the book and obey it. You got plenty of time to learn. You ain't got no time to obey. You got to obey right away. Whatever you read, whatever you understand today, whatever you believe to be true day, today, obey it. Do it faithfully and do it to the most high God. Even if you wrong, I believe the most high God will guide you right. Right. A lot of time, a lot of people, a lot of people act like they they believe a lot of people act like that. What like what they be doing and what they say they believe, but really they do it out of rebellion. Right. A lot of people latch on the theories out of rebellion to God, but they cl they claim they like, oh, no, I'm in this camp or I follow this doctrine because I love God. But in reality, they doing it out of rebellion to God. They doing it because although they see something in the scripture, no, nah, I prefer not to see it that way. They never going to get no understanding. Whatever understanding they do, God going to get taken away from them. Right? 
But if the Most High God give you even a little bit of understanding or you think you got to understand it, make sure you're doing it to God. Make sure it ain't no rebellion in your heart. Make sure you do what the books say. Make sure you're doing it the best you can. I believe the Most High God will guide you to correction. Even if you're doing it wrong, right? Even if you read it, you misinterpreted it, and you thought that's how you were supposed to carry it out, but you honestly did it in the innocency of your own heart, I believe the most I got to pop up right to you and show you or send a man, man of God to you and guide you right. But you don't resist when you when most I got come. Don't try to don't try to predict. Don't put, you know, how the Christians say don't put God in the box. The Christians write about that. They write about that. You can't a lot of times Christians, the main one to do it, but they the main one to tell you don't put God in the box. They the main one putting God in the box, though. Right. Because a Christian, what a Christian going to say? A man of God go to a Christian and tell a Christian, yo, no, no, you understand that wrong. This is what that really means. What the Christian going to respond with? Jesus Christ and nothing else. They going to yeah, They definitely going to hit you with that in that conversation. But they going to respond with, mm, I don't know. God just going to have to show me that. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, nah, I don't know. I'm going to pray on that. God just going to have to show me that. That's not what God showed me. You got a man of God showing you right now. Right? But they putting God in the box to say, no, I got to get some special revelation or when I'm reading the Bible, the words got to glow in my eye or something like that for them to take the word. But that's not that's not how the most of most of God saying that ain't the only way I can show you something through a private revelation. No, when we learn the book nine times out of ten, it's going to be from a man. Right. A man is going to show it to us. Right. So that's what. That's what we read last week. We kind of looked at uh, we kind of looked at uh, Daniel chapter nine, went through it. We saw Daniel was putting the scripture together, how he believed the scripture. He put together this prayer. And in the middle of his prayer, the ark, I mean, uh, the angel Gabriel came to him, tapped him, was like, yo, 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 you know what I'm saying? Let me talk to you a little bit. And he let, let him know how 70 weeks was prophesied for his people and how it was all going to play out. We talked a little bit about how the Messiah was prophesied in that 70 weeks. And the people that they call themselves uh, Old Testament only are the, uh, what they call them, uh, the non-Messianics, you know what I'm saying? The ones that don't believe in the Messiah, those are the ones that, you know, they got to answer to that, right? You got to answer that. You got you to gotta deal with that. If you say you believe, you say you roll with the Old Testament, you believe the Old Testament, you don't believe the New, that's fine. But now you got to answer to the 70 weeks prophecy and how the Messiah fit into that. Who was the Messiah that got cut off? Where is it documented in history? Where can we find some evidence for it? I'm not saying they ain't got no answers for it. I just ain't heard it. All right? So I'd like one of them brothers to go ahead and share it, send it my way. I don't really want to talk to you, brothers, but go ahead and just shoot, you know, shoot, shoot some information my way. I'd be happy to look into it. You know what I'm saying? Because, look, all I'm after is the truth. If it ain't, look, if whoever the Messiah is, that's who I want to serve. I'm just telling you that the Messiah we worship is the one. Right? The Messiah we bow down to, the Messiah that we see is the king. That's the one, right? Yahushua, the one that got, you know what I'm saying, that the Romans put on the cross at the hand of our people. That's the one documented throughout history, right? Can't nobody even deny it. They try to deny him, but can't nobody legitimately deny him. That's the one, All right? Also, let's talk about the prayer a little bit, right? So we looked into the prayer um, and uh, we talked about the components of prayers. Right. So let me put it on the screen so y'all can see it. So we talked about the components of prayer. Let me get this out the way. We talked about the components of prayers. And in those components, you got a few things, right? So we see that oftentimes, at least Daniel specifically, he identified Yah, right? Identify who he is talking to. Then after that, he gave glory to Yah. And he actually gave glory to Yah and confessed the sins of himself and the people. He did that like interchangeably. He kind of going back and forth with that in uh, Daniel 9. And then lastly, he made his request. All right. So he made his request. Um, and this is a this is these are four components of a strong prayer. If you were to look at the uh, we don't have to get it. But if you were to look at the prayer that the most high God sent uh, Yahushua to give us, he said, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Right. Though so that thing he, he identified first our father. What father who art in heaven? Right. So that's that's the idea. You 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 name and then something to kind of show exactly who I'm talking about. Our father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. When, once you say hallowed be thy name. Now you've given them glory at that point. Right. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. That's glory. 
on earth as it is in heaven. Then the request come after that, right? Give us this day our daily bread. Then after that, he, he talk about forgiving the sins, right? He confessing the sins, right? We forgive others or forgive our sins as we forgive others. That's confessing of the sins, right? So all those components are in a strong prayer, right? We see that. We're going to see that throughout all of the scripture. Now, almost all of the scripture, you'll see all four of these. There's some that got three of the four. Some, you know, it's not, it's not a set rule, but it's just something that you look at. You won't find in the Bible where the Bible says you have to have these four components. That's not what I'm trying to teach. What I'm teaching you is looking at the examples of prayers throughout the scripture. These are four things that are pretty consistent through those prayers. Right. So it's something that it'd be good because we are superstitious people when it comes to the scripture. Right. We have to be superstitious. I like using that word because a lot of times we think of superstitious. We just think of people that believe lies. Right. That's what we think about. You know what I'm saying? People who people who uh, people who believe, you know, what I'm saying in horoscopes and people who believe in uh, uh, what's the stuff called? You know, what I'm saying don't leave your purse on the floor. My hands is itchy, itching my, uh, you know, don't split the pole. What's another one? My eye. My mama used to tell me my eye jumping. That mean, you know, I forgot what it meant for my mom. But if her eye started jumping, she said, well, my eye jumping. You know, what I'm saying that thing, that thing. Yeah. Hand itching, eye jump, all that stuff. When people don't, believe don't, in that type of stuff, put, we uh, call them super. Huh? Don't put, don't put mom's purse on the floor. Yeah, don't put the purse on the floor, all that. Right? That means something to them because they believe it. They believe these things. They come from, they come from, you know, real situations at some point. Yeah, I'll put it in the band, sis. Uh, it come from real situations at some point. And so these people believe it, right? There's some experience that's been passed down and they believe it. I want us to have that same super superstitious superstitious nature about the scripture, though. Not about none of this other stuff that can't nobody prove, ain't nobody got no evidence for. We got evidence behind this scripture. That's what we should be superstitious for, right? All right, let's um let's jump into Ezra, right? So we read Ezra a little bit a couple of weeks ago. Let's get back to Ezra. We're gonna read again how the King Cyrus. Remember, we talked about how. Cyrus, the king, he uh he was well aware of uh Isaiah and the prophecy. Right? And we don't know that necessarily, but we know that he saw himself as someone who the most high God commanded. And we read back in Isaiah how Isaiah, hundreds of years before, said that Cyrus by name, right, would be the one that uh to 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 send us back to the land. And what do you know? A king, you know what I'm saying, with the Titus Cyril, Cyrus did exactly that. Right? Cyrus is likely a title rather than a, uh, than a name. Um, but either way, he saw himself as the one. He's looking like, yeah, no, nah, I need to, you know what I'm saying, that's me. All right? And so that's what we're about to read. This is Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. Did Ezra come before uh, Esther? Yeah, Ezra is right after Kings, I think, right? Our Chronicles, one of them. Yeah. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of Yahuwah by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahuwah, God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Right. So we we looked at this a couple of weeks ago. We look like, ain't it interesting that he he see it as his charge from God? Right. And we theorize that, you know, the only reason he would see it as a charge from God is because you got Daniel right there. Remember, you got you got the one the, the king that was titled Darius. Right. King Darius. He told Daniel, like, yo, yo, yo. I'm making all the people worship your God. After he saw Daniel, you know what I'm saying, survive the uh, the lions. He was like, oh, no, your God is for real. Then he sent out something to all the people and said, no, nah, they got to acknowledge Yahuwah. And we saw Nebuchadnezzar did the same thing. You have to acknowledge Yahuwah, right? So now Daniel is standing next to Cyrus, and all of a sudden Cyrus come out with this, talking about, yeah, I've been charged. And we know Daniel, look at the scriptures. He, he in tune with the prophets. 
I like to believe Daniel sitting next to him like, oh, it's Faith Cyrus. That's your title, right? I don't know. Could be you. Could be you. Remember, Daniel was already in tune. We just read in Daniel 9, he was in tune with the 70 years. He was looking like, man, I was reading the book of Jeremiah, and it's about that time. I, I recognize the book of Seth, Jeremiah was set the exact time that we supposed to be going back. It was 70 years. He looked like it's about that time. So Daniel was in tune with all this stuff. And you remember Daniel was trying to make it happen. So it's, uh, for me, I look at it, it make perfect sense. Daniel right next to him. Like, yo, sorry, look. Isaiah said that 200 years ago, though. He said this. Gotta be talking about you. Sire believed it. He looking like, that must be talking about me. So look what he said. After Cyrus started believing that stuff. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahuwah God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. And he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of Yahuwah, God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remains in any place where he sojourns, let the men of his place help him with silver, with gold, with goods, and with beasts, besides the free will offering of the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests, and the Levites. All right, so the chief of the fathers, so this is the leaders of Judah, the leaders of Benjamin, and the leaders of the Levites. All right, keep going. And all of them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of Yahuwah, which is in Jerusalem. Right. So it's not everybody. Right. It's certain of the leaders and it's certain of the people that the Most High God moved to go. Right. Keep going. So if you all remember in our reading before. In the book of Kings, notice that it's only Judah and Benjamin. Right. So if you guys remember that the north and the south was separate at the time, the north was taken by Assyria. They never returned. Right. That was a punishment. Okay. Right? The only reason why Judah returned is because God made a promise to David that there will always be somebody on the throne of Judah, which eventually comes down to Yahushua, is why Judah is preserved like this, right? And the only reason why Benjamin was preserved, because David and Jonathan, who had a friendship and made a promise that their children's children would always like kind of stick together and be really close. So the other 10 tribes, well, I guess probably the other nine, because Levi is like mixed in with Judah. They are all gone, right? Naphtali, Zebulun, um, you, what do we got? Reuben, Dan, Gad, Asher, Zebulun. All those tribes are still gone. They're still not any, they're still in captivity. They're still separated. So only Judah and Benjamin is returning. And Benjamin is cleaving to Judah because of the, the uh, covenant that David and Jonathan had in David's day. All right. I'd honor that so, you. so you can see all the tribes there on the screen. And you got the 10 tribes to the uh, to the left. And then you got technically two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And then you also have Levi. Although Levi is a tribe, it's not a tribe with inheritance. So it's not counted amongst the 12, the 12. Right. But you have Levi, Benjamin and Judah. Those are the southern tribes. That's usually considered the, tr the, the kingdom of Judah. When you think of kingdom of Judah, it's primarily made up of those tribes. That's not to say that no other tribe. You know, no other person person that descends from those tribes are in Judah. It's just saying that primarily is Judah and Benjamin. So when when the people went back, it was the leaders of Judah and Benjamin and Levi that went back. Y'all remember the priests, most of the priests, the Levites and the priests, they ended up going down to Judah. Right. Because that's where the that's where the temple was. And it was so many people. Anybody could be a priest up north. Right. So, you know what I'm saying? We, we, we'll look at that, too, because you're going to see, uh, if y'all remember, when the people got kicked out of the land, when the northern tribes, these tribes here on the um, on the left, when they got kicked out of the land, they ended up uh, they ended up being replaced by Gentiles. And the Gentiles, they, they were superstitious. They thought, oh, man, we getting killed by all these animals out here. Man, it must be because we don't we don't serve the God of this land correctly. So. Ne uh, not Nebuchadnezzar, but the uh, king of Assyria, he ended up sending one of the one of the priests from the northern tribes back. But remember, the priest from the northern tribe was just any old random person who wanted to make themselves a priest. It wasn't the priest of the Most High God. The priest of the Most High God got to come from the sons of Aaron. 
right? That's a requirement. If you don't come from the son to the Aaron, it's not acceptable, right? And we're going we gonna to see a little bit of that just, just in the second year. Keep going. Right. And then also notice, like brother said, uh, he put a bunch of Gentiles in the north. And those Gentiles always like kind of like try to make trouble for Judah when they return. And you'll even see a little bit of that in the New Testament as well. And whoever remains in any place where he sojourns, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts, besides the free will offering of the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Right. So, so listen to what he said. He said, anybody who remains. So he's telling you, look, the leaders went, some of the Levites went, and some chosen people who felt moved to go. But anybody else who didn't go, so it's people who didn't go. He's like, if you don't go, Make sure you give something. He's like, give a little silver, give a little something. You know what I'm saying? Give your animals, give something. You know what I'm saying? To help people out. So the reason why this is important is because we have materials. We're about to see that we have materials to start building the house again. Right? We have to build the temple again. Right? So it's a couple of little key details that I want y'all to kind of latch on to and remember. Keep going. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests of the Levites with them, whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all they that were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver, with gold, and with gold, be careful, with beasts, and with precious things, besides all that was willingly offered. Also Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of Yahuwah, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem, and had put them in the house of his gods. Even those did Cyrus, king of Persia, bring forth the hands of Meredith, the treasurer, Mithredath, the treasurer, and numbered them unto Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. Mm -hmm. And this is the number of them, 30 charges of gold, a thousand charges of silver, nine and 20 knives, 30 basins of gold, silver, silver basins of a second sort, 410 and other vessels, a thousand. So right here, he's naming off, he's naming off the stuff that Nebuchadnezzar took from us, right? So Cyrus, he went into the coffers. He was like, oh yeah, this is stuff right here. Okay, well, here, I'm going to send it back with y'all. But he's naming off the, and counting out the stuff that he took from us. I want y'all to pay attention to what's included and what's not included, right? Keep going. 30 basins of gold, silver basins of a second sort, 410 and other vessels, a thousand. All the vessels of gold and silver were 5,400. All these did Sheshbazzar bring up with them of the captivity that were brought up from Babylon unto Jerusalem. Right? So you don't see nothing about the Ark of the Covenant. We don't see the altar. You know what I'm saying? It's a lot of stuff that, that we would have had to run the temple that wasn't in there. But a lot of our artifacts were. Right? That's important to note because you're going to see that the people got to start building stuff again. Keep going. This is Ezra. Ezra chapter one. What verse we at? We had chapter two. Oh, Ezra chapter two. Verse one. Now, these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity of those which had been ca carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, carried away into Babylon and came again unto Jerusalem and Judah, everyone unto his city, which came with Zerubbabel, Yahushua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Realiah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mizpar, Bigvi, Rehum, Baana, the number of the men of the people of Israel, children of Perosh, 2,172, children of Shephatiah, 300. So jump, jump on down. So it's going to go down and start listing off a lot of the families and the amount of people that came. But it's a good amount of people that came with us, right? Jump on down. I want you to go down to maybe verse, is it 17 maybe? The children of Bezai, 323. The children of Jor. No, uh, maybe a little lower. I'm, I'm trying to get to the part where uh, where it gets to talking about the people that can't go. Or they, they, they could go, but they couldn't participate because they couldn't uh, prove their family I members. I think that's a little later. Hold on. Because they're still naming off everybody. they still naming off everybody. Yeah, it should be at the end of the name. Mm -hmm. What's the last verse? Uh, 69. Oh, okay, yeah, nah, yeah. So if it's six, if the last verse is 69, it's going to be like, uh, what'd you say it was, son? 59? Let's try, let's try, let's try 59. 
It might be a little before that, though. And these were they which went up from Tel Mila, Tel Harsha, Cherub, Adan, and Emmer, but they could not show their father's house and their seed, whether they were of Israel. Yeah, hold on. Oh, we got so Sister Pamela said she thought the Medes had us in captivity. She was like, How did Cyrus get to it? Because Cyrus, Cyrus was a Persian. So the uh the Medes and the Persian had like a little situation going on. Like in history, they kind of had like a it ain't really a joint empire, but they had their own they had their own little agreements and they had their own infighting against each other, but it wasn't like they didn't see each other as totally separate kingdoms. Right. So it got passed on from uh, Darius to Cyrus. Right. So Cyrus was the next king that took on over after Darius died. So we talked about how uh, uh, grab. Um, grab, grab Daniel chapter six. Daniel chapter six. Give me verse one. This is Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. We're going to go right back over to Ezra chapter 2. This is Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. Right? So that's Darius, right? And if we go to the very end of Daniel chapter 5, verse 1, this is right before that. Right? So Daniel chapter 5, verse 1, give me like the last verse. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the th before the thousand sorry give me the last verse and Darius yes, Daniel the chapter Median. 5 whatever the last verse is and Darius the Median took the kingdom being about 62 years old right so Darius became king after after Babylon so Babylon was ruling things and then Darius became the ruler so y'all remember when we were reading the prophecies of Daniel, where Daniel was seeing prophecy and he, one, he saw that there were multiple beasts. Then he started to name off who those beasts were. So like that first beast that they saw, that, that Daniel saw was Nebuchadnezzar, right? Then the second one with the Medes and the Persian, right? That was that bear. Remember the bear that was up on one side? That's, that's the Medes and the Persian. That up on one side is talking about how the Medes was a little bit, you know what I'm saying, a little bit off center from the Persians, right? And then it went on and, you know what I'm saying, if you continue to go through it, it gets to the Greeks and then the Romans, right? But this is, uh, this is, uh, this is kind of how we end up getting to Cyrus, right? So after Darius, Cyrus takes over. So now let's go back to, to uh, Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, you're going to see that it's Cyrus. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Oh, that's still Darius in, uh, mm -hmm. in nine. So then let me get, uh, what come after now? I think it's, uh, let me see what 10 say. It might be seven though. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing. Yeah, so this is, so in 10, it's the third year of Cyrus. Let me see, uh, uh, Daniel seven, because Daniel's not in order. All right, let me see what Daniel chapter 7 say. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a, Daniel had a dream. Okay, now that 7 takes us all the way back. All right, so you can see 10 is the third year of Cyrus, right? So that third year of Cyrus comes after, um, comes after Darius, which we saw in chapter 9. So the, it's just a natural pro progression. After Darius, Cyrus took over, although they're two different nationalities, two different, uh, yeah, two different nationalities, they have almost like a combined kingdom, right? Their kingdom has like a certain contract, you know what I'm saying? It's, 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 not, as it's not as though, they kind of allies, put it like that. They're allies, and so they kind of just took over the kingdom from the other one. That's how Cyrus ended up coming into place. So Cyrus still has us in captivity, and he's not the only one, right? So the king that Esther deals with that we're going to read about later, that's also of the Persians, right? 
And so these are the same kings. If you ever seen the movie uh, 300, right? It's like that. It's that dude, you know what I'm saying, where they got Artaxerxes and all that. And he, you know what I'm saying, he looked like a Egyptian. I don't know what he looked like. I ain't going to make fun of the man. But you know what I'm saying? He looked, he looked crazy. He got a bunch of eyeliner on and all that. I ain't going to say they looked like that, but maybe they did. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I ain't looked it up in history. But um, but th that's that's what they're trying to depict. Usually this is like the same time period. Wrong. Huh? I said, usually Hollywood always get it wrong. So, but. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? They gave, they gave the man a little bit of color. They made his skin all bronze. You know what I'm saying? But like he stayed getting the tan. Um, but let's go. Let's go back now. Let's go to uh, this is Ezra. We was at verse what fifty something. Uh, yeah. Hold on. This is Ezra chapter two verse fifty what? Ezra two verse fifty nine. This is Ezra chapter two verse fifty nine. And these were they which went up from Tel Mila, Tel Harsha, Cherub, Adan, and Emmer. But they could not show their father's house and their seed, whether they were of Israel. Right? So look, they went up with us. They looking like, yeah, we're going back. Ooh, we're going back home. We're going to build the house. Every, you got to imagine, this got to be an exciting time. It's got to be a very emotional, exciting time for people. We going back. It's time to get back home. Right? When they get there, we looking like, yo, 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 who your daddy? Okay. And who is daddy? Okay. And who is daddy? Okay. And who, and we trying to trace it all the way back to prove that you're an Israelite. Right. So some of these people, we couldn't find no record of their they parents. We looking like, uh, mm, I don't know, buddy. I don't know if you actually an Israelite. So read it again. What we said to him. And these were they which went up from Tel Mila, Tel Harsha, Cherub, Adan, and Emmer. But they could not show their father's house and their seed, whether they were of Israel. Mm -hmm, keep going. The children of Deliah, the children of Tobiah, the children of Nehoda, 652. Uh, and the children of the priests, the children of Habiah, the children of Kaz, the children of Barzillai, which took a wife of the daughters of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and was called after their name. These sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore, were they as polluted, put from the priesthood. Right? So amongst them, they had people that said, oh, no, we're priests. Right? So then we had to look it up like, oh, you're a priest. Well, you got to tie that all the way back to Aaron. And we couldn't find evidence of, we couldn't see, we were like, I don't know. So then we said, okay, you're as though you were polluted then, right? In other words, it's as though you were a priest, but you defiled yourself in such a way that you can't participate in none of the priestly functions because we can't prove that you a priest. We can't prove that you valid, right? Keep going, watch this. I just want y'all to see how serious we took it coming back into the land. Why would we be this serious going back into the land? We were just kicked out for not obeying the commandment. We were just kicked out for not obeying the law. Right? So naturally, you want to be careful now. Right? You're going back to the land. You're about to build this thing again. You see God is serious. Now everybody want to be careful. Now everybody want to make sure we're paying attention that we're doing this thing right. We're not making no mistakes. So you're about to kick them boys out. Right? Keep going. What else? And the Tirshatha, and the Tirshatha said unto them, that they should not eat of the most holy things till the, till there stood up a priest with Urim and a thummim. The whole what does that mean? They need to be a priest that had got word from God. Right? When a priest stood up and the priest had the Urim and the thummim, then that point we would ask God through the priest. This is special. You got to understand. We might experience this. I just want you all to know this. We might experience this in our lifetimes or maybe in our kids' lifetimes or maybe in their kids' lifetime. But at some point, the people going back to the land and the prophecy has it that uh, 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 Elijah is going to turn the heart of the children back to the fathers and the fathers back to the children. Right. So that means that at some point we're going to be connected back to our ancestors. Which would tell us, oh, I'm of the tribe of Simeon, or I'm of the tribe of Issachar, 
or I'm of the tribe of Judah. Everybody going to want to be from Judah. There's a lot of brothers running around now. Well, I'm, since I, you know what I'm saying? Since the slaves got carried, the slaves that got carried to America from Judah. The slaves that got carried, the ones that, they say Haiti is, uh, I think they say Haiti is the Levites. They said the slaves that got carried to Haiti, they the Levites, right? And they tried to just section it off just like, just like the Gentiles was that careful about what they do. Okay, let's separate out. What tribe are you from? The Gentiles don't know nothing about our tribe, but they separated us and tried to say, okay, this is the Judah ship. Take them to America. Like, what are, you know, these people don't make no darn sense. But we make up stuff just because, you know, we, we need something to believe in sometimes. So people just make up stuff. But we don't want to believe just because we need something to believe in. We want to believe because it's factual information. We want to believe because when you open up the book, that's what it say. I got something that I can stand on that I can believe. Right? When we look at this, this is something we could believe. Our pe That's the natural ability of our people is to prove it. That's why these people are saying, listen, I like y'all. I know you say you're a priest and we all happy about going back to the land. But now you got to prove what family you from. Right. And if I can't prove it in that case, it's a way to deal with every situation. We got to wait until a priest is sitting down who got the arm and the thumb. Who remember what the arm and the thumb was? No, the arm and the thumb, remember, were the stones, right? So when the priest had his garment, he had all the stones of Israel on it, right? The 12 stones, right? The high priest. Then after that, he had the arm and the thumb on his, on his breastplate. The arm and the thumb was kind of like when you see the books that they cast lots. That's how the arm and the thumb work. You would cast it, and I don't know exactly how it worked, but you would cast it, and somehow it would give you... A, it was said to give you a message from the most high God, right? So the most high God would communicate with the high priest only through the arm and the thumb. So if a man throughout the scripture, we've seen it a couple times, but if, if you remember, we would go and we would say, should we go up to X, Y, and Z? Should we go up to take Gil Gilgal? Should we go up to take Gilead? Should we go up to take these lands? The priest would be the one that cast the arm and the thumb and get an answer from the Most High God and then give it back to the man. Like, yes, you should go. Or no, you shouldn't go. God don't want you to take that. So essentially, if y'all remember uh, when we first went into the land, I think we, uh, I think we, uh, trying to think. When we first went into the land, Joshua was taking us, right? And he cast lots. For um, what's his name? Aiken. Yeah, yeah. He cast lots for Aiken, right? It's kind of like that. Aiken, when we are trying to figure out who who actually uh who actually uh stole the the cursed thing, we cast lots, and the lot fell on a family, and then it fell on you know what I'm saying it fell on a tribe, and then it fell on a family, and then it fell on Aiken's family, right? Then after that, you know what I'm saying Aiken got dealt with. So the arm and thumb kind of is a similar situation, except the high priest is the only one that can handle it. And then we would look at it and we would say, OK, you know, what I'm saying the way they would use it in this situation, they would say, OK, what tribe are you from? You say you're a priest. OK, most high God is a priest. Throw, you know, what I'm saying throw the arm and the thumb them out, get an answer and it'd be confirmed or denied. If it's denied, then we will deal with them as such. Right. So we are just saying, hey, look, you guys sit to the side. You can't participate as a priest until we figure out where you really from. Right? Keep going. There, the whole congregation together was 42,360. Right? So that's a lot of people that came back. 42,000 people came back. Right? Keep going. Besides their servants and their maids, of whom there were 7,337, and there were among them 200 singing women and singing, singing men and singing women. Their horses were 736, their mules 245, camels 435, their donkeys 6,720, and some of the chief of the fathers, when they had come to the house of Yahuwah, which is at Jerusalem, offered freely for the house of God to set up in this place. They gave unto their ability unto the treasure of the work 
61,000 rams of gold, drams of gold, 61,000 drams of gold, and 5,000 pounds of silver, and 100 priests' garments. So the priests and the Levites and some of the people and the singers and the porters and the Nethanims dwelt in their cities and Israel in their cities. And when the seventh month was come and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Right. So this is the seventh month of the year. Right. What happens in the seventh month for us? What about the day of trumpets? Right. The day of trumpets happens. The first day of the seventh month is a day of trumpets, which makes it a day of remembrance. Right. And then you also have uh, the day of atonement. And then you have the in gathering, right, the feast of booths or the feast of tabernacles. Right. It's all the same thing. In gathering, feast of booths, feast of tabernacles, all the same day. Just different names are all the same uh, time period. Just different names for it. Right. But that all happens in the seventh month. So they came back. How fitting. Right. They came back in the seventh month which is the Feast of Tabernacles in the middle of that month, right? Which is the exact same time that King Solomon finished the temple. He may have started it around that time too, but he finished the temple definitely in the seventh month, right? This is, uh, uh, keep, uh, keep going. We should be in chapter three now. Yeah. It's Ezra chapter three. Keep going. When the seventh month was come, the children of Israel were in their cities, in the cities. The people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then right. Up. So the children of Israel talking about Judah. Right. We went in and we started to dwell again in our city. So you remember, our cities is all burnt up and tore up. But we started to kind of get things together and get back into our city. Of course, we don't have no temple. But we at least are starting to live in our cities again. Right. Everything messed up. And then we gathered ourselves together and the book say we gathered as one man. Keep going. Then stood up Yahushua, the son of Jehozadak, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, mm -hmm. the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and build the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So notice, notice, um, notice a couple things. One, notice the brother is saying Yahushua when we read it. The name that you're going to read in, in, in most of the Bibles that you're looking at is going to be Joshua or Jeshua probably here. But we read it as Yahushua here because it's, it's important to understand, especially when we start getting into Zerubbabel or, or not Zerubbabel, uh, Zechariah. It's important to understand that he shares the same name as Yahushua, the Messiah. Right. And so and he also testifies of Yahushua, the Messiah, also in certain uh, certain places. But he does share the same name. All right. So keep going. Oh, uh, and then another thing you should notice is read it again. What, what verse did you just leave off on? Two. Two. Read verse two again for me. Then stood up Yahushua, the son of Jehozadak, and his brother and the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So they built the altar, right? But they built the altar as it was written where? In the law of Moses. Is that an upgrade or a downgrade? That's a downgrade. That's a downgrade, right? If we had to build the altar according to the uh, law of Moses, that means we're building it according to the tabernacle, not according to the temple. If you remember, the Most High God gave David different designs. He gave David different designs when when uh uh let's see if we can get it. Grab um grab um first Kings chapter six. First Kings chapter six. Let's try verse, let's start at verse one. And it came to pass in the four hundred and eighteenth year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt. In the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the in the month Ziph, which is the second month that he began to build the house of Yahuwah. 
Mm -hmm. And the house which King Solomon built for Yahuwah, the length thereof, 60 cubits, and the breadth thereof, 20 cubits, and the height thereof, 30 cubits. And the porch before the temple of the house, 20 cubits, was the length thereof, according to the breadth of the house, and 10 cubits in the breadth thereof before the house, and for the house that he made windows, and for the house he made windows and narrow lights. And against the wall of the house, he built chambers round about, against the wall of the house round about, both of the temple and of the oracle, and he made chambers round about. The nethermost chamber was five cubits broad, and the middle was six cubits broad, and the third was seven cubits broad. For outside the wall of the house, he made narrow rests round about, that the beams should not be fastened in the walls of the house. And the house, when it was in the building, was built of stone made ready before it was brought thither, so that there, so that there was neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building. The door for the middle chamber was in the right side of the house, and they went up with winding stairs into the middle chamber and out of the middle of into the third. So he built the house and finished it and covered the house with beams and boards of cedar. And then he built chambers against the house five cubits high and rested in the house with timber of cedar. And the word of Yahuwah came to Solomon saying, concerning this house which you are building, if you will walk in my statutes and ex execute my judges and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then will I perform my word with thee, which I spoke unto David, your father. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. So Solomon built the house and finished it. And he built the walls of the house within the boards of cedar, within with boards of cedar, both of the floor of the house and the walls of the ceiling. And he covered them in the inside with wood and covered the floor of the house with planks of fur and he built 20 cubits on the side of the house both of the both the floor and the walls with boards of cedar he even built them for it for it within even for the oracle even for the most holy place and the house that is the temple before it was 40 cubits long and the cedar of the house within was carved with knops and open flowers all with cedar there was no stone seen and the oracle he prepared in the house within to set there the Ark of the Covenant of Yahuwah. And the oracle in the forepart was 20 cubits in length and 20 cubits in breadth, 20 cubits in height thereof. And he overlaid it with pure gold and so covered the altar, which was of cedar. <laughs> so Solomon overlaid the house within pure gold and he made a partition by the chains of gold before the oracle and he overlaid it with gold. The whole house he overlaid with gold until he had finished all the house. Also the whole altar that was of the oracle, he overlaid with gold. Right. The so you see, you see the altar here is very different from the altar that we had from Moses. This thing overlaid with pure gold. And Solomon didn't just make that up. Grab uh uh first chronicles, might be second. Grab first chronicles 28. Can't be second, right? Gotta be first chronicles. Yeah, First Chronicles chapter 28. Give me verse 1. And David assembled all the princes of Israel and the princes of the tribes of the captains of the companies that ministered to the king by course. The captain this is David, right? Keep going. The captains over the thousands and captains over hundreds and the stewards over all the substance and possession of the king and of his sons with the officers and with the mighty men and with all the valiant men unto Jerusalem. And David the king stood up upon his feet and said, hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had in my heart to build a house of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of Yahuwah and for the footstool of our God and made ready for the building. God said to me, you shall not build a house for my name because you have been a man of war and have shed blood. I'll be it, Yahuwah of the, the Yahuwah. When he said a man of war and shed blood, what are you talking about? David was always in a fight. And what he did with uh, uh, Uriah's wife. Right? Uriah. Right? When he put, remember, he put Uriah in the front lines of battle in a place where he knew he would lose. Right? He put him in the front lines of battle and killed him. He effectively murdered him. 
right, over his wife. He slept with the man's wife and then put him in the front lines of battle so that he had died and then ended up marrying his wife. Right? So that's what the most high God is talking about. The most high God said, no, nah, you, you shed blood, right? You a man, you shed blood and, and you did it in war. But specifically, you a man of war and you shed blood. All right? Keep going though. Watch this. How be it, Yahuwah God of Israel chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he has chosen Judah to be the ruler in the house of Judah, in the house of my father, and among the sons of my father, he liked me to make me king over all Israel. And of all my sons, for Yahuwah has given me many sons, he has chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of Yahuwah over Israel. He said unto me, Solomon, thy son shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son. And I will be his father. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever if he's constant to do my commandments and my judgments as at this day. Now, therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the congregation of Yahuwah, and in the audience of our God, keep and seek for all the commandments of Yahuwah your God that ye may possess this good land and leave it for an inheritance to your children after you forever. And you, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For Yahuwah searches the hearts and understands all imaginations of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Take right. heed now, for Yahuwah has chosen thee to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. David gave Solomon his son the patterns of the porch. Ah, there we go. That's what I was looking for. What verse is that? 11. 11. I thought it was somewhere near the top. So he said, David gave Solomon his son what? The patterns of the porch and of the houses thereof and of the treasures thereof and of the upper chambers thereof and the inner parlors and of the place of the mercy seat. The pattern of all that he had by the spirit of the courts of the house of Yahuwah and all of the chambers round about the treasuries of the house of God and all and of the treasuries of the dedicated thing. Also for the courses of the priests and the Levites and for all the work of the service of the house of Yahuwah for all the vessels of service in the house of Yahuwah. So he notice he said also for the courses of the Levite, all this stuff was given to David by God through the spirit, it said, and then also then handed from David to Solomon. So David got it from the most high God through the spirit, not Solomon. David then handed that to Solomon because David wasn't worthy enough to actually build it. So David gave that to Solomon. So then when we read that Solomon in 1 Kings 6 is putting it all together and he decking that thing out with gold, it's not just because Solomon is like, well, this is how I think it should look. No, he going after the patterns that he got from his dad, that his dad then got from the father. Right? And then from there, we fast forward and we go all the way to Ezra and we got Zerubbabel and Yahushua, the son of uh, who? Jehoiada? Jehoiada. Jehozadak, Yahushua, the son of Jehozadak, and they trying to put this thing together, but they got to use Moses' designs. Why? Why would they have to use Moses' designs? That's all they got. That was what's written in the law. It's written for Moses. Look, Moses, how to design the altar is detailed. Right? When you look at when you look at Solomon's, it wasn't detailed. All it says, the altar decked it out with gold. He didn't give all the details about how he built it, piece by piece, how large it was, how you measure it out. If we went back, we ain't got to right read it now, but if we were to go back and read how Moses laid it out, we could build that thing right now. Right? He laid it out in detail. So they went with Moses, what Moses had, because in their mindset, we got to use something lawful. We know that we can't just build our own altar. That's against the law. So if we build the altar, it has to be patterned after the designs that the Most High God gave Moses. So that's what they try to do. Right? Let's go back. This is uh, uh, Ezra 3 what? Uh, Ezra 3 verse 2. We on verse two? Yeah. 
All right, this is Ezra chapter 3, verse 2. What's the book say? Ezra yeah. chapter 2, verse 3. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Boy, they going off over there. Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> what are you doing, bro? Uh, I'm communicating with people in the chat. I know, but why don't you just communicate verbally? <laughs> because we trying to, you know what I mean? That's that's a good idea. <laughs> That is a good idea. <laughs> that is like, <laughs> <laughs> hilarious. It's right by my mic, Sharon. Just relax, all right? Calm down. Ezra chapter 3, verse 2. Then stood up Yahshua, the son of Josadak, and his brethren, and the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon. As it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Mm -hmm. And they set the altar upon the, his basis, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings thereon unto Yahuwah, even burnt offerings morning and evening. Sister <laughs> <laughs> Sharon is hilarious. If y'all if y'all ain't if y'all online and y'all ain't in the chat. Y'all missing out when Sister Sharon gets to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> they kept also the Feast of Tabernacles as it is written and offer the daily burnt offerings by number according to the custom as the duty of every day required. And after according to, according to what? Uh, burnt offerings by number according to the custom as the duty of every day required. Mm -hmm. Where'd they get that from? They got that from the law. They got that from the law of Moses also. I want y'all to just see the stuff that they put in place, and it's going to tell you where they got it from. All right? Keep going. And afterward, offered the continual burnt offering, both of the new moons and of all the set feasts of Yahuwah that were consecrated, and everyone that willingly offered a freewill offering unto Yahuwah. From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto Yahuwah, but the foundation of the temple of Yahuwah was not yet laid. They gave money also unto the masons and to the carpenters and, and meat and drink and oil unto them of Zidon and unto them of Tyre to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea of Joppa, according to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month, began Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Yahushua, the son of Jehoshadak, and the remnant and the remnant of their brother, and the priests, and the Levites, and all that all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of Yahuwah. Then right, so at this point, now they said in the Levites in order. Right, watch this. Then stood Jeshua, Yahshua, with his sons and his brethren, Cadmiel and his sons and, his, and the sons of Judah, together to set forward the workmen in the house of God, the sons of Henadad, with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of Yahuwah, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets and, with, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise Yahuwah after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. After they, what? The ordinance of David, king of Israel. So notice here, it is after what David gave. When it comes to the, the courses of the priests, it is after what David gave. Why would that be? Uh, I know they're searching the genealogies, going back to the genealogies. David, at the end of, not at the end of his, of his life, I think it was when he got back after that stuff that happened with Absalom. David had certain ordinances with the singers in the, in the, um, and the priests and stuff like that, he set up like like certain things that they should do, you know what I'm saying, with singing and like recording, like scribes and stuff like that. I know the sons of Asaph was, uh, uh, they wrote some of the Psalms too, so. Exactly, right? David was detailed with that piece, right? He gave all the details. He said, 
this is going to be the courses of the priest. I think it was 24, 24 courses of the priest or something like that. We don't have to get it right now. But he goes into details about how the priest should be set up. What, you know, what family should be doing this, how the courses should go, how many courses it is. So that's why if you had a genealogy, you can tie into that and also, you can do it just like David set it up. Also, right. Uh, oh, when God pronounced judgment on Eli back in judge, was that, that was Samuel, right? In Samuel, when God pronounced Eli, uh, judgment on Eli, he said, your son's going to die very young, right? And y'all going to be cut off from being priests. So Eli's family, uh, that happened in David's day. When uh, David went out and he was running away from Absalom, one of the priests joined himself to Absalom with Eli. When David got back, he, he cut him off just like God said he would. It was like prophesied that Eli's lineage would no longer get to be priest. So after that, you will start seeing the sons of Zadok being like uh, the priests. And uh, that's another thing, because when you're getting back into the land, they want to follow the law. Right. And obviously they would have understood that. God pronounced judgment on Eli. So that means Eli's descendants in this day can't be the priest. So David set it up to where it's like all of the sons of Zadok will be the priest and will be the heads of their father's houses. Um, and so that's another reason why, you know, they are uh, setting it up exactly how David had it. Yeah. So, so when you look at it, what's happening is they have to take what is documented, right? They have to take the scripture. And they have to try to put everything back in order. Right. Remember, this is 70 years, everything running smoothly, everything going and it's going from the time of David. Right. From the time of, of Solomon It's from the time of our kings on to now. And it's running. Right. And then all of a sudden it stopped. For almost probably 40 years, 40, 50 years. Right. 70 years started our captivity. But the temple got destroyed for it was probably down for about 40, you know, 40 to 50 years. Right. So that's that's a long time. That's like a person's whole lifetime. Right. It's very few people that's old enough to have seen the actual temple at this point. So now after all of these years, now people are having to go through the scripture and see what they can find to set this stuff back up. So if I'm going to build an altar and I got a description of the altar that Solomon gave us and his description of the altar is just, hey, I, I, I laid gold all over that thing. That's not enough for me to build it, right? I can't just build it all based off of that description. Solomon had the description, but they didn't write that down in a way that I could look at it from the scripture, right? So me going, since I wasn't around when Solomon put it together, now I have to use what I have. So based off of that, I got to go to what Moses had because it's more detailed. What Moses documented has all the details to where I can recreate it today. What's documented for David and Solomon don't have all the details to make me recreate it today. But when it comes to the courses of the priests, David started that. Right. So when that wasn't that wasn't something that was commanded by Moses. But since David gave the details of the courses of the priests, that's something that now I can recreate when I'm trying to set the temple back up. This is the same type of stuff that we're going to have to go through. When we go, if y'all see fit, that we be the ones that go back in. Whoever is the ones that go back in, don't we? The, it's the same type of stuff that we're going to have to deal with because we're going to be looking at it and we're going to say it got to be based off of the scripture. The only difference is we're going to have some designs and we're going to have some instruction based off of what um, uh, uh, um, I can't think of Ezekiel, right? Based off of what Ezekiel said. And we're going to have a prophet that's probably going to get word directly from the most high God and be able to get that guidance, right? But these are the same types of things that we have to look at. Our people are very specific. We're not going to go in and just take guesses, right? We're not going to go in and just be like, oh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, let's try to redesign what Solomon had, but I don't have enough detail to really, really put it together exactly how he had it, right? With Moses, I do. So that's what they did, right? Keep oh, going. Sister Pamela, oh. is, uh, Sister Pamela said she's asking a question. So she's saying David gave the order for the priest, but not the building they go in. Yeah, no, I think that's what I just explained. Yeah. Yeah. So they they it's it's just it's just that one had details documented in scripture, one didn't. They wasn't around when David was around. They wasn't around when Solomon was around. So it's not like they can remember what it looked like or anything like that. It has to be just like us. If I told y'all, if I told y'all, yo, go out and 
build an altar that's lawful for God, y'all would go and choose Moses because y'all got enough detail to build, build, build that. If I told you you're going to be held accountable for not building it right, right, it got to look just like it did when they put it together. Nine times out of ten, a person is going to choose what Moses designed because he gives more details. You, more, you got a better chance to get it right. Right. But the priest, uh, David, did get the details for that. Right. And there is no option for Moses because David is the one that put that in place. Yeah. So David. Um, uh, David, it was I did like for David to build God a house, but God had to give him the patterns. Right. David can't just build a house for God like he wanted to. So God gave David the patterns. Right. So. You know, David had the idea. God still had to give him the patterns because David probably would have got that idea from Moses. Like, hey, Moses built him this this tent, right? This amazing tabernacle. You know, let me build him a house. So God had to give him the, something similar to what Moses had or had to give him something that was okayed by God. Yeah, I think it seemed like yeah, this Pamela question is more so he gave the details of the priest but didn't get the details of of the house. Yeah, and Moses did give instructions for the priest, but David, David not like no, nah, not not like what we talking about though. Yeah, right. David, he yeah. gave he gave instruction for the priest. There was no courses for the priest. So the courses that goes all the way to when Yahushua was born. The courses is talking about a time frame in which a certain group of priests would serve. Right. So it would say this group of priests serves for six months. I don't think it was really six months. It was something like that. But it was this group of priests served for this amount of time. This group of priests served for this amount of time. And those courses were not set up by Moses. That didn't exist with Moses. Brother T explained Moses. that too. But that, put, that was put in place to make sure that the appropriate groups of priests were serving and that it cut out anybody that the Most High God said shouldn't serve. Right? So he set up the courses so that all the different families of priests, now that our, 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 our tribes and our people have grown, there's a lot of different families of priests. So it's all the different families could then participate in the priesthood. Right. So he set up the courses. That was something that the most high God gave to David. Right. And David put that in place, not by his own, you know, will, but the most high God gave that to David. That wasn't a part of our law. Now there was instruction for the priest from the law, but it's not the same thing. It's a, so, it's a, it's a different, different uh, institution that he so put the in. Most high, the most high God got to always keep his order, right? The order is, all sons of Aaron, right? Only the sons of Aaron can be priests, right? However, when Eli did what he did in Samuel, that cut off, e even though Eli is a son of Aaron and all Eli's children is a son of Aaron. So now they got to be careful in making sure that Eli's descendants do not get to serve as in, in the priesthood because they were, God had put that punishment on him. So that's when David got more specific. So you will start to see a little bit after Kings, like what we read now and a little bit later, you will all like the sons of Zadok will always be emphasized because the sons of like because Eli's family can't be priests. So you'll start to see the sons of Zadok. Seeing the sons of Zadok is almost just like seeing son of Aaron, because now you got to separate like the family of Eli. Like now y'all can't serve. Now we just dealing with all all of Zadok's descendants. And they and at the same time, they are also sons of Aaron. So they have to get more specific. All right, let's keep going. What else we got? Uh, what verse we on? We are on 11. And they sung together by course in praising and giving thanks unto Yahuwah. Because this he is chapter Yahuwah. four? He, no, chapter chapter three. Chapter three is chapter, is Ezra chapter three, verse 11. And they sung together by course and praising and giving thanks unto Yahuwah because he is good for his mercy endures forever towards Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised Yahuwah because the foundation of the house of Yahuwah was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and the chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not discern the noise of shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people for the people shouted with a loud shout and the noise was heard afar off right so these people had mixed it, it was a it was a mixture in the in the in the town because you got some people that had never 
remember, it's been probably 40, 50 years, right, since the temple been destroyed. So it's some people that was born that had never seen the temple, right? A lot of people had never seen the temple. So now that we laid a foundation, and this is the exciting thing. Oh, we get to go back to the land. We laid a foundation. We looking at it like, oh, wow, this is great. We're reestablishing ourselves as a people, as a nation, right? We're happy about that. But then the people who had already seen the temple, they sad because they looking at the foundation like, man, this ain't nothing like I would rem remember 40 years ago, 50 years ago, however long it was, right? They old, right? Probably got their cane. They looking at it and they wagging their head at that thing. Probably 80 years old, wagging their head like, no, nah, man. I was 20 years old when that temple was put together. You know what I'm saying? Like, I saw that thing in my own life. I remember I was graduating from school and I walked past the temple. And then, you know what I'm saying? Like, they got memories of the actual temple. And they looking at this like, man, this thing ain't no way. Look at this foundation. It's too small. Ain't nowhere near the size of what Solomon put together. You know what I'm saying? So they looking at it like, man, this is a travesty. So all at the same time, you got some people shouting and cheering. And you got, on the, at the same time, some people crying. And you couldn't tell, right? You couldn't tell who was doing what. It all sounded like the same thing, but everybody was mixed, right? That's the end of the chapter? Yeah. All right. We can stop there. We'll pick up chapter four and kind of go into um, kind of how these Gentiles are dealing with us, right? We'll look, at, we'll look at that next week, right? But this is important to see that the foundation is being laid for us to come back into the land. We have been away from the land for 70 years. Daniel has been alive this whole time. Daniel is a very old man. Remember, he got kicked out. He was amongst the first to be taken into captivity. So remember, he spent the whole 40 years in uh, captivity. I mean, the whole 70 years in captivity, right? So he was amongst the first to be taken out. And then after being taken out, he had to sit his butt down and he had to serve the enemy. I love mentioning that part because we forget that. He had to serve the enemy with humility while the enemy is terrorizing our people. Right. Again, I'll say it all the time. We would call him a Uncle Tom today or a coon or one of these other words that we assign to black folks that be doing that. These people do be coons. I want to be clear about that. These boys are definitely coons and definitely Uncle Tom. But y'all got to know how to decipher a coon from a real one when, it, when they going to look the same. Daniel would look like one. Right. So we can't be just throwing out the coon and throwing out the Uncle Tom too quick. We got to assess, be law legalistic when it, about it. OK, hold on. Is he doing that? OK, do it line up with this? Oh, do we offend the law? He don't offend the law. You shut your darn mouth. If what he doing, don't offend the book. Uh, shut your mouth. Don't speak on nothing too soon. Don't judge nothing too soon. Just wait. And why? We don't always have to be first to call some out. It's not necessary. We don't have to predict the future. We don't have to call nothing out. We don't have to be the first to say it. That's all for our glory. Remind yourself of that. When you're reading through the prophecies and you're trying to interpret prophecies and be, oh, it's going to play out this way and it's going to happen this way. Oh, now the market of beasts is going to be Bitcoin and all this other stuff. Maybe, right? Maybe it is. Maybe it ain't. But you, that's your glory if you're trying to predict the future. Why did the Most High God give us prophecies? Why does he tell us what's going to happen from at the beginning? Why does he tell us what's going to happen at the end? So that we can believe. That's for us to know that he is God. That's for his glory. Right? So if we sit there and we, if we wrong about it, we don't know what's happening, don't understand the lick of it, that is okay. God is not necessarily telling us all this stuff so that we know beforehand. He's telling us all this stuff so that when we see it, we can be like, that's a bad man. He said it happened just like I forgot he said that. It's for his glory, not for ours. A lot of times we start getting caught up and we don't realize we trying to glorify ourselves. Oh, brother, no, let me tell you what's going to happen. No, see, the real thing is, you know what I'm saying, Obama is the Antichrist. Shut up. You spend, you spend eight years calling Obama the Antichrist. Now he, Obama, you know what I'm saying, I ain't wishing no death on him, but eventually Obama going to be dead and gone and he not going to be the Antichrist. So now you look dumb. You told your whole congregation that for eight years, for what? When you could just shut your mouth and wait. You can't just put no antichrist on no man. Trump is the antichrist. Biden, the antichrist. every president is going to be the antichrist for y'all.
And then you know how they clean it up after they wrong, right? Well, technically, brother, all of them is Antichrist if you got the spirit of the Antichrist. Uh, yeah, you're right. You know what I'm saying? But don't try to aim what you were saying in the first place, though. You're right, though. But that ain't what you were saying at first. You know what I'm saying? We know what you were saying at first, right? It's important. We got we, we to we gotta make sure we submit ourselves to the order of the Most High God. Just as, just as our, our, our fathers were doing right here back in the land. We try to submit ourselves back to the order of the Most High God, and they just trying their best to get it together. We got to do that now. We got to lay the foundation for the temple right now, right? In our hearts, right? And in our souls. We got we to gotta look and say, how was it done? Right. When we look at the behaviors or that's written in the scripture, we got to look at it and be studious and say, OK, this is detailed enough for me to follow. Because if we don't do that, we're not going to see a lot of this stuff. None of this stuff is promised to us at any point. The most I got to say, all right, time's up. We talk about it all the time. He counted it out for, for the, uh, our fathers that was in the wilderness. He counted it out for their butts. He said this 10 times y'all rebelled against me. And the whole time we read numbers, we didn't see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine. He did not tell us anything like, okay, that's one, that's two, that's three. You only got till 10. He didn't give us that warning. He popped up one day and said, it's 10 times y'all rebelled against me. Who would have known that was going to be the count? We don't know the count. We keep playing with God, but we don't know the count. We don't know when the man going to be like, no, nope, that's 175 right there. Because you know, y'all, we got some leader. We be running it up on sin now. Rebelling against God, we run it up on him. He only gave them 10. He giving us 300, 338. You know what I'm He giving us these crazy numbers. Whatever the number is for us, though, we don't know that count. He just going to pop up one day and be like, you did. That's it. But we can't play. We got to be studious and look at it. No assumptions. What does the scripture say? That's what it say. Okay, boom. Be very technical with it. That's why in our fellowship calls, or for those who join, that's why in all the stuff that we look at, we're very technical, right? Because that is what's going to save our soul. Daniel was technical. When Daniel laying out his prayer, he wasn't just saying, oh, but well, it's just what I feel. No, no, no. He technical. When you read what Paul's talking about, he's technical. Yahushua, when Yahushua walking around, he's technical. You can't even ask Yahushua about a darn sandwich. You hungry? You want a sandwich? No, no, the 11 of the Pharisees. Because the man is always, th he take everything tied back to the scripture for him. Right? Could you imagine being around? I can't wait till we get to the gospel. Because I want y'all to see Yahushua as he was. We be all, oh, I would have loved Yahushua. Nah, yeah, y'all would have been, this guy's annoying. You know what I'm saying? I can't even get a sandwich for my man. Huh? Okay. Right? Any questions? That was too quick. Both of y'all too quick. Whoever said too quick getting knocked out. Whoever said too quick getting knocked out. Whenever you say no, it ain't no question too quick, you get knocked out. No cap. I understand now. They confused too. Huh? All right, let's pray out.